Greetings fellow time travellers. It's always lovely to have you with me as we travel through time and space together. On here is where we take a few moments, a few minutes every week uh, to contemplate the ways in which the past might help us better cope with the present and thereby the future. But before we get started on today's episode, I just want to say thanks to all those who show their support for the podcast series by signing up to my Patreon.com site. It's the financial support from the Patreon presence that helps make everything else possible, the love letters and the rest. So if you're a member, thank you. If you're not and you'd like to become a member, go to Patreon.com, look for me by name, part of some cash, uh, you can join for a year or for a month. It is cheaper by the dozen. Sign up and become a member and you get, well, you become part of the family. Uh, You can see what other people who are interested in history are saying to one another. You can take part in the conversation. There's questions and answers. You can talk to me directly with that. Competitions, vodcasts, podcasts, loads. It'd be great to have you as part of this family. We call ourselves time travellers. So sign up and join in. It'd be great to have you along. Okay, that's enough of the advert. It's time to strap yourselves into the time machine as we set off on the next stop on my love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music. All the grandeur of those cities was founded upon, built upon built with the wealth generated by slaves. So the, the opposition to ending the slave trade was uh, monumental. In this podcast, we're plunging into a life unimaginable. The abject misery and horror of human slavery. Nations throughout history, from the ancient Egyptians and the Greeks to the Romans and Muslim Arabs, have all plagued the world with this abhorrent trade. And the British Isles, of course, up to our knees in human despair and suffering we were, and we grew fat on the colossal profits to be made from that exploitation of our fellow human souls. Many people fought to end this hateful practice, amongst them a tireless MP, Member of Parliament from Hull, a man who was determined never to rest until slavery had been abolished. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the British Isles. Hi Neil, in the last podcast we fought the French on the Welsh beaches when Britain was invaded for the very last time. Where are we this week? Yes, indeed, we did. Yeah, the last invasion, or the last attempted invasion, what a story. In the last episode, revolution swept across France and Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette lost their heads on the guillotine. This week, it's a very different kind of revolution. Here we are in Hull, Kingston-upon-Hull, where William Wilberforce is striving tirelessly to abolish what he knows to be a profound human wrong, and that's human slavery. Paul, we're in Kingston upon Hull. I think I'm probably right in saying that Hull, it's a town that a lot of people associate with maybe unemployment. I have to say, though, I have found it to be a place full of fascinating history. I've been there numerous times. Various people are connected to it. For a couple of years before lockdown and the rest of the restrictions, I was touring my book, um, The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places, to theatres up and down the country. And there was a theatre in Hull, that was one of my destinations. And I had a fantastic reception. I had a great audience and the whole thing, you know, just in that way that sometimes these sort of one-person performances, sometimes they go better than others. And it was was such a good night. And if, if for no other reason, that made Hull a place that I'm very fond of. The reason I've included it in the love letter to the British Isles is because it's the birthplace of William Wilberforce. And of all the names on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean that are associated with the abolition of the slave trade, there's none that more instantly come to mind than William Wilberforce, who was MP for Kingston-upon-Hull. And for most people, he's absolutely synonymous with the fight against the slave trade. That was the great stain on humanity. To this day, 
slavery of one sort or another remains the indelible stain on humanity. As we all know, everybody's done it. Every civilization from the beginning, from 5,000 years ago and longer, was built on the backs of slaves of one kind or another. So slaves in the Middle East, in the ancient world, Ur and Babylon, the Persian empires, Greek civilization, Roman civilization, all of it, all of it was built on slavery. And then in the 18th century, of course, we, the British, got up to our knees in the misery, the human misery of the African slave trade. And so it's, it, slavery has always been part of the human story. But it bears noting, it's significant that it was the British Empire that was the first of all the empires to do away with, with slavery for itself, under its own volition, at a time when no other force in the world could have made Britain stop doing it. And so that itself is noteworthy. But it was a long time coming, and it came after a long story of misery. So William Wilberforce, he was, he became MP for Kingston-upon-Hull, and it was with that position that he was able to campaign from within the House of Commons, within the Palace of Westminster, on behalf of his constituents, you might say, but he, he led, he was a, a strong voice in what was known as the abolitionist movement to end the slave trade. But he was, he was born in Kingston-upon-Hull, born on the 24th of August, 1759, in a very fine house that you can go and visit. That would be the destination for this love letter. A very finely appointed house on Hull's High Street. The house itself, it wasn't built for the Wilberforces. It was built in the 1650s, uh, before their time, for a chap called Hugh Lister, who was a merchant, and he was in the business of exporting uh, lead from Derbyshire to Holland. And he made money, got rich, did Hugh Lister, and he had the house built. But it was then acquired by William Wilberforce Sr., being the grandfather to our William Wilberforce, uh, and that was in 1732. And William, younger William, our William, was born in a small bedroom. You can go and see all this, you can go and visit. It's, it's amazing because it's a, a street within Kingston-upon-Hull, the old high street, and there's an atmosphere about it not least because of the presence of the William Wilberforce house that, that gives you a sort of a sense of, of what the place might have been like in the 18th century. It's a bit of a leap of imagination, but it can be done. You can go and visit the house. And he was born, you can go and see it, in a small bedroom, right next door, through the wall from a, a very grand banqueting room on the first floor of the house, all wood panelled and lovely. And little William was born in the bedroom next door. And in, in that way of, of so many characters that come to prominence that we've discussed... He was a sickly boy, but I think a lot of children were. You know, I think that was the reality of it. Infant mortality was, was so overwhelming. So many youngsters died before their first birthday or, or never made it into adulthood. And I think so many children were just laid low with childhood ailments. And if they survived at all, they quite often had a sickly, poorly start. And William Wilberforce was certainly one of those. He, he also suffered from, he was short-sighted. So he didn't have natural advantages, you wouldn't say. He was a Hull Grammar School boy. He was, he was obviously he was born into some money to begin with. There were some some advantages, but those advantages fell away when his father, Robert Wilberforce, died, and that obviously severely impacted upon the financial well-being of the family, apart from anything else. And his mum sent him away from Hull to live in London with relatives, and that happened to so many kids. You know, the, the parents, for one reason or another, couldn't afford, couldn't provide for the youngsters and made whatever provision they could for them, and so, so off he went to life with relatives in London. To our modern ears, that sounds very harsh, doesn't it? Well, what are you going to do, I suppose? You know, time and again, it was the story for people. They fall on hard times, and there weren't the kind of welfare, social care alternatives. There was no help to be looked for, and so all that people could fall back upon for help was family. If they were lucky enough, you know, if they were even lucky enough to be able to do that, to draw upon the support and the intervention of family. And so just as a youngster, he was, he was sent away, and so the rest of his life began to unfold in the capital city. He's so connected to slavery, but it's definitely worth just underlining what slavery was and what it had come to be by the latter half of the 18th century. You know, as I've already mentioned, the Egyptians 
built their pyramids and everything else and built their civilization on the back of slaves, the Greeks, the Romans, every culture, every creed, uh, Muslim Arabs were great slavers fr from the 9th century, from the 800s onwards, and they captured and they bought and they sold white Europeans as well as black Africans. They were heavily involved acquiring and trading in slaves from Africa long before Europeans were. It's important to note that the chiefs of the tribes in West Africa were complicit. A lot of listeners will be aware of uh, Neil Ferguson, the economic historian, a Scot, and he has, has pointed out that the chiefs, the rulers in West Africa, those men were, they were not running a scout camp, in Ferguson's words, but they were engaged in the slave trade. And so, although Arab people and white European people were buying the slaves, West African tribal leaders were making slaves available for sale. So everybody was involved. Nobody's hands are clean in the story of, of human slavery. Everyone was either selling them or buying them or growing fat on the proceeds of the free labour. And they're still with us today. Slaves are still among us. They're here in Britain. We know they are. Stories of the abuse of people who've been brought in from desperate regimes and desperate countries elsewhere in the world and people come here trafficked and smuggled in and then they end up in lives that are little better than slavery. Women and girls that are brought in for the sex trade, others that are brought in to work as, as unpaid house servants, others to work in factories, people working in, in slave-like conditions, harvesting fruit and vegetables. They're, they're all around us and not just here but all around the world. And, and so slavery is just always there. It's a constant in the human story. But having said that, there's no getting away from the fact that we became the masters of it. We became its ultimate practitioners in the 18th century. It's been estimated that maybe 50,000 African slaves were being shipped every year across the Atlantic throughout the years of the 18th century. Millions, maybe 12 million people. And obviously, uncounted numbers died en route because of the conditions aboard the slave ships. No count kept of that, so we've got no way of knowing really the total number of people that were affected one way or, or another by that trade. And if you go to the, Wilber the, the Wilberforce House, and obviously because of his association with ending slavery, there are lots of pictures and, and other illustrations to do with the, the literature and the imagery that he was using to show his colleagues in, in Parliament what the conditions were like aboard the slave ships. So there are pictures and paintings on the walls that show it and it shows a plan view of a, of a slave ship viewed from above with the top deck taken away so that you can see down into the hold where the people were kept. And at first, I remember looking at one of them in the house and f for a split second, it was like looking at a cigar box full of spent matches, you know, matches that had been burnt and all just stacked up inside it. And then it was only when you looked at it more closely that you could realise that it was actually human beings just stacked cheek by jowl beside one another, several layers high in shallow bunks. You know, not an inch was wasted in terms of maximising the capacity. And they were, they were shackled, you know, they were shackled hand and foot. They were shackled to the beds that they were lying on or the pallets that they were lying on, shackled to each other. A desperately depressing imagery. And the sadness of it is the pictures weren't even put together by the abolitionists. These were just pictures that showed the industry. They were there as kind of owner's manuals. This is how you maximise the space within a ship moving human beings across the Atlantic. William Wilberforce, you know, he wasn't born knowing about the slave trade. And it wasn't as though in his adolescence he became aware of it. It was just around him, part of the world that he grew up in. He attended Cambridge University. While he was there, he met and befriended William Pitt, the younger, who would be a prime minister. And by the time he was 21, Wilberforce was MP for Hull, which sounds very young, but that was the 18th century for you. And men came to their maturity and came to prominence, especially privileged young men like William Wilberforce, perhaps younger than we would think of today. But then it was during the 1780s that he kind of went through a like a Damascene conversion when the scales fall from St Paul's eyes on the road to Damascus and he, and he realises the, the truth of himself and the truth of others. So it's during the 1780s that he has his Damascene moment, his conversion to 
evangelical Christianity. So he becomes a Bible reader, uh, a committed church goer. His experience of getting involved in church going and worship and Christianity, it made him desperately personally aware of the suffering of others. The biblical message that's there, certainly in the New Testament, about it being the obligation of of right thinking, righteous people to not be comfortable in their own lives if other people are suffering oppression and physical misery. And that was very much the effect that his Christianity had on him. Uh, So he's a big Bible reader. One of the love letters to the British Isles has been about the King James Version of the Bible that came into being in, in 1611. He definitely worked from a copy of the KJV. know why he became religious. The company he was keeping, he found himself in the company of people who were evangelical and the message got to him. You know the way, you know, like, I mean, you'll remember at uni, you come across people that are members of the Christian Union and and you come across people that are passionate, they're protest groups, aren't they? And Christianity in his day in Cambridge University, people preaching evangelical Christianity was just another of those groups and he, he came into the presence of it. And he was just influenced. He was just influenced into that way of thinking. And then in 1787, he met a chap called Thomas Clarkson, who was another devout young man at that point, a Christian, very sensitive to and moved and motivated by that Christian message. And they became the best of friends. And the friendship that they struck up at that point lasted a lifetime. And it was Thomas Clarkson who was committed to the abolition of slavery even before Wilberforce. You know, Clarkson had been, he had gone through his own Adamacene moment. I think either at school or possibly at university, he'd taken part in an essay writing competition. The motion that had been suggested as the topic for the essay put forward by the master was about slavery. And Clarkson wrote an essay that was persuasive and won the competition. And on account of having done the research and having written about being against slavery in that way, it affected him and it got under his skin. And he became committed to it. And then he, after meeting with William Wilberforce, he communicated the same ideal to William Wilberforce. And so the two joined up and two people working together towards an end is much stronger than one person working alone. And it reinforced the commitment of the other to have a close colleague, a close friend who was minded the same way. And so they campaigned from that point on. So it was in 1787 that they met And then in 1789, so within a couple of years, Wilberforce made a speech to the House, the House of Commons, in which he said of the Atlantic slave trade, the number of deaths speaks for itself and makes all such inquiries superfluous. As soon as ever I had arrived thus far in my investigation of the slave trade, I confess to you, sir, so enormous, so dreadful, so irremediable did its wickedness appear that my own mind was completely made up for the abolition. A trade founded in iniquity and carried out as this was must be abolished. Let the policy be what it might. Let the consequences be what they would. I, from this time, determined that I would never rest till I had effected its abolition. So, I mean, that's in 1789. So the campaign, you can imagine the opposition that there was to abolishing the slave trade because the wealth was incalculable. On both sides of the Atlantic, people were getting fabulously rich. The plantations, sugar, tobacco, cotton, they couldn't be profitable without labour you didn't have to pay for. If you had a constant supply, an ever-replenishing supply of labour you didn't have to pay, then you could get incredibly rich. I mean, it's not, it's not difficult to imagine why. You don't have any wages. And so those industries, if you had slaves, were incredibly profitable. So the people running those plantations were absolutely opposed to anyone doing anything. It took the American Civil War, ultimately, to to end slavery in North America. But back in Britain, it was the same. You know, the profits from tobacco, the profits from cotton, as we've said previously in relation to places like the Merchant City in Glasgow and Bristol and Dublin, it was all the grandeur of those cities was founded upon, built upon, built with the wealth generated by slaves. So the, the opposition to ending the slave trade was monumental. So it wasn't until 1807, so it was into the 19th century, on the 25th of March, in fact, that Wilberforce reached his milestone, or his first milestone, 
Because on that day, in the House of Commons, the abolition of the Slave Trade Act was passed and it banned the buying and selling of those who were already enslaved. And it was carried by 283 votes to 16. So when the vote actually came to pass, it was conclusive. So people who were already slaves, you couldn't buy them and you couldn't sell them, but they were still slaves. It was like you have a car, you can still drive it, you just can't, you just can't sell it. So 1807 was a step along the way. But at that point, there were something like, oh, 700,000 slaves in the North American colonies whose lives changed not a jot because it didn't, they weren't freed. They just couldn't be bought and sold. It'd be illusory to think that slavery ended at that point. It only banned the buying and selling of people. But then, Ultimately, on the 26th of July, 1833, a decade later and more, Parliament finally passed a bill to end slavery itself throughout the empire. So it wasn't until 1833 that it actually became illegal to acquire slaves. And Wilberforce had lived long enough to hear the news, but he died three days later. He was on his deathbed when he heard the news that the vote had been carried through Parliament, ending the trade once and for all. But it was a month after he died that the Abolition of Slavery Act was finally passed by the House of Lords and came into effect. But again, although it ended slavery, it didn't end. The the people who had been slaves, effectively their lives didn't change because they had nowhere to go and nothing to do it with, even if they had gone. And so they became what were called unpaid apprentices. Most of them just stayed on where they had been property. They mostly stayed on and their their status kind of technically changed from being slaves to being apprentices. It was kind of meaningless. And in any event, in the intervening period after 1807, Britain had acquired other territories in the Americas where slavery was still going on. So the plight, although the paperwork was going through Parliament, the plight of enslaved people did undoubtedly continue. Having said that, there are things that have to be Acknowledged from 1808, the the British Royal Navy had a West African squadron, thousands of men, thousands of sailors aboard ships whose every effort was put into stopping slave ships coming and going, leaving West Africa with slaves. And they captured countless ships and they freed countless people who would otherwise have been taken into slavery. So it was a long and complicated story. Uh, But there's no denying Although it was imperfect and although the plight of of the enslaved, you know, it it took generations really to move it forward, William Wilberforce was was undoubtedly, he was as much of a figure in all of that as anyone else that you could possibly name. There are other things to know too. After 1833, the Parliament decided, as well as abolishing the slave trade, that they would compensate slave owners for the loss of property. Because technically, because the slaves were being freed, those who had owned them, in the understanding of the time, were losing property that they had bought and paid for. And in 1837, the British Treasury took out the biggest loan in history. In today's money, it would amount to hundreds of billions of pounds. And it was paid in compensation to the slave owners. And that debt, which the British Treasury created, by sending all that money to compensate the slave owners was only paid off by British taxpayers in 2015. Really? Yeah, so you and me and everybody else, our taxes were still, up until 2015, were going in part to settle the debt that was generated in the aftermath of slavery because the British government took the step of compensating the former slave owners. So it's a murky business you know, with light and dark within it. But William Wilberforce, undoubtedly, was a bright, shining light. And you can go and see it. His is the only 17th century house remaining on the high street. But there are two um, Georgian houses uh, either side that that kind of got knocked through, if you like. So the whole thing is the William Wilberforce Museum. That was created in in the 1950s, I think. And you can go in and you can see the whole story of him. You can read the whole story of the long, tortured process of seeking and finally achieving abolition. And there's a statue of him in the front garden. When you come in off the high street, the house is set back off the high street and you walk in and there's a a statue of the man himself in the garden. And it has on it the words, No Englishman has ever done more to evoke the conscience of the British people 
and to elevate and ennoble British life, which is interesting in itself, because you know that the statue isn't just talking about English people or English life, but British. So that by that time, by the time of Wilberforce's achievement, the, the population of these isles were being encouraged to, and were to a great extent, thinking of themselves as British. The man himself, he's buried in uh, Westminster Abbey. Remember, we did a love letter from Westminster Abbey. 3,000 people are buried inside Westminster Abbey, and pff, countless more have plaques and statues raised to them. But Wilberforce is in there, in the north transept. He's right by his, uh, his old friend William Pitt, former British Prime Minister. And in the back garden, part of the ground that was the back garden of the house, is the Nelson Mandela Peace Garden, which was created in 1983, which you'd have to admit probably... William Wilberforce would probably approve of that addition to his old property. There is no, uh, there's no brighter figure in the story of British attempts to abolish the slave trade. William Wilberforce is a bright and shining light in that story. He sounds like a great orator. Was that the case? I think so. I mean, obviously we've got no, we've got transcripts and so on. But yes, he was a persuasive. I think he was. I think more than anything else, he was just incredibly stubborn, and and he persevered. You know, I mean, he he he, he had his religious conversion in the 1780s. 1787, he meets Clarkson. By 1789, he's on his hind legs in the House of Commons, telling his parliamentary colleagues why they shouldn't be doing this anymore. And he keeps at it until 1833. When he dies, I mean, it, it, it's with him till he dies. So he's he's a stubborn, he's a stubborn man, determined, and uh, he got there in the end. Do you think that it was ultimately successful because it was a slow and steady revolution? I think it, there's a terrible poignancy about it. Yes, it did. It, it drew a line. Gradually, by 1833, it had drawn a line. At that point, the, the slave trade was abolished. The ownership of human beings in the British Empire, in the territories of the British Empire, was brought to an end. And in any event, from 1808 onwards, you know, the West Africa Squadron, the Royal Navy had been seeking to, to stop movement of newly captured people across the Atlantic. And then by 1833, there was a line drawn, but the, the misery of people continued. And slavery is still there, is the point. It's never gone away. The Ottoman Empire had slavery, and in the Middle East there are still slaves. I mean, you look at the story, you look at the, you know, the, the shaming story of the construction of the, of the football stadium for the World Cup in Qatar. They're not chattel slaves in the way that the people in, in the North American colonies were, but they're worked as slaves, and they're exploited as slaves. And it's everywhere. There are men, women and children in the Democratic Republic of Congo mining the cobalt that's going into batteries for electric phones and electric cars and computers. And their existences are little better than those of slaves. And so that, despite the landmark achievements of Wilberforce in 1807 and then in 1833, that tendency of the human species to exploit the misery of our fellows is with us yet. An old way of life put to death, a devastating crime committed in a heart-rendingly beautiful landscape, insidious greed and the violent pursuit of money. Landowners, lords and ladies right across the highlands, systematically destroying an ancient culture. Clans obliterated and villages wiped off the map. Ripe for profit, the highlands are cleared, one of the biggest mass movements of people in all of British history. Next time, in my love letter to the British Isles. To help support this podcast, which is and always will be free, and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment videos every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. It would be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter. And please write a review of this week's podcast and share it with your friends.
For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places, and it's published by Trans World. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. Social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production. <laughs>